You are listening to Mind Pump, the world's number one ranked fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. It's true. We're mm. number one. Yeah, we're number one. Now, this episode is a Q&A episode, so we answer people's questions about fitness and health. But the way we open the episode was with an introductory portion where we talk about current events, stuff that's happening in the world, talk about our workouts. We mention studies. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. I'm going to give you an entire breakdown of this episode, so if you want to fast forward or skip certain parts, you totally can. Don't by the by, the way, if you want a detailed rundown of what happened the whole episode, go to mindpumppodcast.com and you'll see timestamps and you can go right to what you want to listen to. But if you want to have fun and digest us the way that we are meant to be eaten, Ooh. start from the beginning. Yeah, get those nutrients. Here is the breakdown. So we start out by talking about Justin's poor sleep. He's got puffy eyes. Yeah. Poor guy. I'm so tired. He's going to be trying Brain FM, by the way. See if that helps out. By the way, Brain FM is this amazing app that you can listen to certain sounds that elicit brain waves that are conducive for sleep or meditation or even focus. Go to brain.fm forward slash mind pump, get a hookup. Then we talk about a show on Netflix called High Score. Great show that led us down a path of reminiscing about old video games. Yeah. Then we talked about Justin's Choose Your Character post on the Mind Pump Instagram page. Super Sal. He made fun of me. That was really nice. In fact, he wore my really short shorts, which are now back in style. Joke's on you guys. Man. Yep, you're always is. ahead of the curd, Sal. Now, Viore makes some amazing shorts, but they make lots of athleisure wear for both men and women. These are comfortable clothes that you can work out in, but you can also go out in. And Viore is one of the only companies we know of that has a lifetime guarantee on all of their products. That means you could buy the pants or the shirts or whatever, wear them for, I don't know, five years, Take them back and get a refund. Isn't that crazy? Anyhow, here's how you get the Mind Pump discount. You get 25% off, by the way. Go to vioriclothing.com. That's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash Mind Pump. They have a brand new fall collection, by the way. Go check it out. Then we talk about the supplement called Neuro Effect. It's for your brain. Makes you think sharper. And Organ Complex. This is a supplement that is organ meats but in pill form because, you know, liver, heart, and kidneys taste disgusting. Ugh. But you want all the nutrients. So the company that provides both of those is Paleo Valley. They also make amazing meat sticks. Uh, their focus is high-quality, nutrient-dense uh, products in pill form or food form like bars and uh, meat sticks. Again, I mentioned those because they're grass-fed and they're delicious. Um, and because you listen to Mind Pump, you get 15% off. Here's what you do. Go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump for that discount. Then we talk about how KFC is no longer finger licking good. Mm. I disagree. Kind of makes me sad. I always lick my fingers when yeah, I go I like there. To lick fingers. Then we talked about our friend Juji Mufu appearing on American, uh, what is it called? Ninja Warrior. Ninja Warrior. That's yeah. it. Thank you very much. No problem. Then we talked about the Attila Gym in New Jersey, our heroes. Figuring out ways to stay open. Yeah, bucking the system. Stay strong, guys. Then we talked about the PPP loan fraud that's going on all over the place. I talked about a study uh, that Men's Health posted that talked about resistance training being more effective than cardio. Then we talked about Dion Sanders on Barstool, uh, which is kind of cool. Dion. And then we talked about Adam's dog, Mozzie, has an eye infection. Uh, send your prayers, please. Then we got into the questions. Here's the first one. This person says, what's the best way to keep muscle while losing body fat? So we talk all about that. The next question, what's the deal with smelling salts? Do they actually make you stronger? How do they work? The third question, They're fun. this person wants to know how often they should be doing mobility work because uh, time is of the essence. And the last question, this person has been tracking their diet and their food and their calories, proteins, carbs, and fats, and is not feeling very good mentally. Wants to know how to transition out of that. Also, four days left. One, two, three, four. Four. And this sale will be over. I'm talking about the MAPS Performance Sale, where it's 50% off. MAPS Performance is a workout that includes both traditional and non-traditional functional exercises. So this is what it produces. A physique that is muscular yet balanced and mobile. In other words, you'll look good, but you can also move good. You're not going to be one of those gym bros that looks yeah. ripped but can't throw a baseball and can't, can't wipe sprint. His ass. Can't wipe his butt. You're going to be able to wipe your butt if you follow MAPS performance. Yeah, it's important. Functional training, athletic style training, combined with traditional barbell, dumbbell exercises to develop amazing physique. Oh, by the way, 
if you don't have access to a lot of equipment, if all you have are dumbbells, you can still follow Mass Performance. We added a home gym mod to it, so now there's no excuses. Anybody can follow the program and reap the benefits. Again, it's 50% off, four days left. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsgreen.com, that's M-A-P-S-G-R-E-E-N.com, and then use the code GREEN50. That's GREEN50 with no space for the discount. Justin. Yeah, you have a uh, you. You have such a nice sleepy face. Like Droop, a, droopy I got eyes. like bags under my. Yeah, eyes. but I don't know. It like, makes me want to like hug you a little bit. Maybe put you in a blanket. Yeah, cuddle I, you up. I get like I don't know. Like I want to cozy up to something. I'm just like hey, I'm here, but I'm not like all the way here. Yeah, what's, you know what, what, what happened? Why are you so sleepy, oh, dude? I don't know. So I mean, we've been obviously all over the place with where we're staying these days and whatnot, and so we're at this hotel. And I the first night I was there, I didn't have a problem because this this weird like sort of electrical noise was just something that kind of drowned it out and I just was able to pass out but I figured out the next day what it was we're right next to these elevators and there's like an electrical engine room right underneath our room and so like every five to ten minutes we hear a and then it just like repeats and I heard that all night long and I just I couldn't get out of my mind like just ignore it no I couldn't ignore it I don't want to see Justin break Adam no because yeah. I feel I'm, like are you back there tonight yeah bro you gotta hook up your brain FM I 100% oh yeah, yeah I totally forgot about that's, that. that's you know like you do bring your, do you have a speaker or do you want me to bring you one uh yeah I have a little I have a little speaker yeah maybe you could play it for the whole room and then everybody yeah. could just well, well you guys it's all that and so now here's the other thing too right so I mean it I, I'm glad I found this place because it's it's really hard to find right now because everybody else has it has been evacuated and so everybody's like you know occupying all these places. Uh, but this place had enough space I could bring my dog, so everything the layout's great. But uh, also the AC is only in the other room with the pull out bed for the kids, so it's right next to them and they freeze, so they turn it down at night. And we don't have one in our room and it's walled off. So I have like a little fan, but like, I, so around 4 a.m. too, like it gets like swelteringly hot in our room. So I'd open the door and then put that and suck all that air in. And anyway, that's, that's my drama. Well, you are in charge of the, of the family. So you can switch the rooms with the kids if you want. Yeah. Hey, do you guys want, want to sleep the, on the couch? Do you guys want the big bed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yay. Yeah, I know. Right. They'd feel like champions. Maybe yeah. I will do that. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Oh, man, I don't want to see Justin crack, dude. It's getting close, you know? So if I have a moment on here, you guys know why. I don't want to see Kong come out. <laughs> Did you guys watch that? Have you guys seen that? Speaking of Kong, there's, mm. a, there's a series on Netflix. I've only watched two episodes, but it's really entertaining. It's what called it? High Score. Mm. Oh, I see. I saw the preview to it, but I haven't watched no, it. I haven't. So it's all about like the history of video games and how they took over and yeah, how they yeah. grew. Oh, and sick. Oh, it's so it's so cool. So I did not know this. So Donkey Kong was Nintendo's one of Nintendo's first mm -hmm. big hits. This mm -hmm. is when they were making arcade games. They got sued by Universal Studios uh, because Kong because King and, Kong, and they said, "Oh, it's King Kong." Yeah. And so what they did is the, the makers of, of Donkey Kong got a team of lawyers and they went all around America and other countries finding other uses, other businesses using the word Kong. They found like a Kong car wash and yeah. a Kong, you know, play thing or whatever. Yeah, they get like dog toys named Kong. Yeah, and yeah. So they brought that to the court and they basically said, look, all these people use Kong. Uh, and and nobody's going after them. They're just trying to squeeze us for money, and they won. Oh, and that wow. was how Nintendo was able to get a foothold, catapult them, huh? and really grow. Yeah. So the whole this is the best part. the The show parts of it are narrated. Yeah. By the guy that invented or that created the worst video that's widely considered to be the worst video game of all time. Do you guys know what that game is? <laughs> is that the Pong back and forth? No, that game was, oh, that was sick. Yeah, that, that game yeah. changed Pitfall, everything. Pitfall, which what was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so do you guys remember? Did you guys have Atari Twenty Six Hundred? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Do you guys? Okay, think of like the worst, worst game. I bet if I Adventure say Adventure Island. Uh, that was, was pretty it? bad. Yeah. That, I don't, that was so, a bad one. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, That's yeah. the Pitfall one, isn't it? Or are they two different ones? No. Mm. I, well, no. Pitfall's different. I it think. is. Okay. So the worst game, because when he when he said it, when they showed the game that he made, and he's like widely considered the worst game, I own this game, and it was the worst game of all time. What is it? <laughs> E.T. 
Oh, E.T., oh. yeah. Yeah, that was such a, a, a letdown. Because you're like, this is after it was popular and the movie was out and everybody's excited about it. And you didn't and even it know it was terrible. You didn't even know what to do yeah. in the game. You're like, move yeah. around. And he falls and you're dead. And you're like, what happened? <laughs> so the story behind yeah. that apparently is this guy, they, you know, Atari was crushing and they were making good games or whatever. And they got approached uh, by the movie, the, the, what is it, the the production company that makes E.T. I don't know who, who made E.T. or whatever. Like MGM or something like that. Uh, whatever. Company, yeah. They approached uh, Atari and said- DreamWorks or something. Yeah, we want to give you- I don't think DreamWorks ex- yeah, uh, existed. Yeah, probably not back then. I don't know. We want to give you guys the rights to make the E.T. game, okay? But we need it done in two months. So back then, games took minimum nine months to make. So this one, you know, the, the programmers who was super cocky, it's funny when he tells the story, he's like, hell yeah, I can do that. Oh, shit. Months. So he just throws together some BS game. 24 hours a day, he worked on this game, delivered the game, and he's like, oh, I did it. Well, they ordered millions of copies of this game. It was the biggest flop in yeah. video game history. And then it led to Atari basically crashing because then they all they, they their strategy was – flood the market with as many cartridges as possible and all the games suck. So was yeah. this is this the birth of Nintendo at the same time? Well, Nintendo... No, dude. Okay, did they go into like the history of Nintendo how long they've existed? Oh, it, it was in Japan. Yeah, but like it it goes way further back than I even realized. Doug, Doug looked that up like cuz it it was like uh, I mean like I don't way back towards like the 19 I want to say like no, like you're 30s right. 30s or what? There was a, like 40s. What? Yeah, like way back. Oh yeah, they had no. They I'm had, serious, bro. They had secret video game technology that they did not let know. Stupid, let, no. dude. No. <laughs> Nintendo's not that old. No, it's n- old. No, Nintendo a video game console isn't. But, but the, Nintendo, well, yeah, but the company itself. Is right. I didn't. E- I didn't even know that. So Nintendo, yeah. the company was is goes. Well, let's wait to see the actual it was con- confirmation. Fact check time. Yeah. Fact check time, <laughs> Douglas. <laughs> 1889? 1889. Like, like, what? Is that mind-boggling or what? So it was a playing card company, and it was this Japanese playing card company that made these cards, and then they got into the video game business. So I got one for it you doesn't guys. Doesn't even make sense. Did I, so my buddy, my buddy still has this. It's great, and it's like his parents passed it down from their parents a game. It's like the first, like their first version of a video game. So this is well before Atari, Nintendo, anything like that. And what it was, it was a football game. And it was a bo- it's like a, it's like this cardboard box, and there's a light bulb underneath it, and it's football. So we're playing against each other. You're offense, I'm defense, and you have all these cards, and you and you put your play down, face down, so you can't see it. Uh-huh. And then I put my then I put my defensive play down and over it. Simulates it. it, and then you and then you slide the cardboard down, and then the light illuminates the play. Huh. And it and it has little lines of like where your receiver or your running back go, and then if my defender lined up right with it, that's where you what yard line you stop on. If I didn't have a defender there, and you go all the way to the touchdown, touchdown. you score a touchdown. Okay, why Whoa. does that why does that sound like a super fun game? It yeah, is. That does we, sound awesome. We still pull it out and play it every once in a while. Do you really? Dude, yeah. That and me- remember the uh, the one that vibrates all the little guys on the top, so on the <laughs> yeah. bottom it like moves and shifts the guys. <laughs> yeah. So we used to have that one too, dude, which dude, is awesome. So they were talking about. Do you guys remember? Um, God, what was it called? What was the arcade? That they had at like Oak Ridge Mall or all the malls. It was like a brand of arcades. It, was, it wasn't Galaga. That, that's an actual game. It was like. Mm, not, we had special effects up in our area. So they showed the arcades and how kids used to hang out in yeah, them. Yeah, that's what it was called. So in Japan, um, Space Invaders yeah. got so popular, they actually had a shortage of 100 uh, yen coins. Wow. Because so many people were playing. Just constantly throwing them in there. Yeah. Do you yeah. guys remember when you first got your Nintendo? Yeah. Oh, that was like totally like the biggest thing for me and my brother. We we had been like begging and pleading, doing extra chores and working for my dad and all this stuff just to get this Nintendo because we did have the, the Atari, but we saw like our friends that had the Nintendo. And it was like so much better. It was not even funny. Like, I mean, they were playing Zelda. They were playing all the Marios. And yeah, dude. So you're saying Donkey game. Kong was the biggest. So I thought it was Mario Brothers. I thought Mario. Mario Brothers. So Mario was in, was in Donkey Kong. Yeah, he's the guy, the character. But That's Mario. Yeah. So, and, and so then Donkey they, Kong came first and then Mario? Yeah. And then and then Mario. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. No, thought, Ala- oh. Aladdin's Castle. That's the name of the arcade. Mm-hmm. Do you guys remember Aladdin's Castle? No. Oh, that was the, that was the place. That's the place you went. And you know what's funny? So when they're showing the video game, so my kids obviously are obviously a lot younger than me. 
So to them, this is all like <laughs> obviously, obviously. Yeah, no, that'd be weird if they I'm were. Glad you me. stated that. I had a child <laughs> that clear before I was born for the audience. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we defied the laws Clarity of physics. Clarity is good. My my kids are watching this, and oh yeah, there's Aladdin's castle up top left. Look at that. Oh, that's, I remember so that's that. Just, it's, that's not a brand of it's a brand of an arcade. Arcade yeah, is yeah, what yeah, I meant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, my kids are watching this, and to them, it would be like me watching, you know, when I was a kid, World War II videos. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, whoa, Dude, that's hilarious. Yeah. So they're watching it, and there's there's old clips of like like the malls and kids hanging out and my son's watching this and, and I, I realize just how strange this must be to them. Of course, they're commenting on the style. My daughter's like, why are, the, why are their hair so big and why are they dressed so stupid? And I'm like, you yeah. just wait, that'll come back in style. Right. And then my son's like, why is everybody just like leaning up against the wall and like not doing anything? I'm like, because that's what we did. Yeah. We didn't look you at our phones. on the wall. We all yeah. hung around and, each and other. You, you <laughs> and looked talked. at people. We would just sit there and talk yeah. to each other's faces <laughs> so and not do anything Dude, and hang out. You know, it's funny though about like Nintendo and the, uh, so I, I tried to get my kids all into it because that's like nostalgia for me. And so we're playing Mario and I found out like on YouTube, there's this whole thing where you do runs like as fast as you possibly can. I've done that. Yeah. And so we started to try and do that. Do you, do you remember how hard the physics are? Uh, with with Mario, like mm-hmm. if you get really into it and like you're trying to go for a speed, like it really fucks you up. Yes, I, I I got to the point where I could beat the entire game uh without dying in less than I think it was like ten minutes. What? Yeah, because there are there's, there's, there's all these shortcuts and warps. Yeah, and warp stuff. levels yeah. and stuff like that. So like like I think it's the third level. You can warp to like level six. On and the then, first Mario, or are you talking about Mario first, three? First no, 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 Mario. first Mario. Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, remember yeah. that in the first oh, one. Mario three was my favorite. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, my brother was so into it, dude. Do you guys remember Nintendo Power? Yeah. Okay, so this was the magazine. Yeah, uh, gives you that, all the secrets. So before that, Nintendo had like counselors that you could call in because it's before the internet, right? Now <laughs> you go. They did. So you, <laughs> I am a Nintendo counselor. Yeah. Now I'll if you have a struggle with a video game, this. you go on YouTube, like my son yeah. does. He goes on YouTube. I can't get around this, whatever. And then the, the dude on YouTube tells him what to do. Back then, you call in, yeah. and there was a counselor, and they had a binder in front of them, and they would tell you what to do. Uh, and yeah. then they had Nintendo Power. This is how into my into it my brother was. You uh, needed that for Zelda, dude. My, you couldn't find you anything. Did. My brother wrote letters to Nintendo Power, got one of them published. No. Yeah. No, he didn't. He did. He got one of his letters published. Please tell me you have that. He's got to have he that. He has it. Classic. He's got to have that. He has it. That's has it. that's rad. Yeah. So this is like a big deal. Yeah. And then <laughs> they had Game Genie, which was. Have you ever? Did you ever play with that? So of you can see all these dude. cheat codes. So what was funny about it was you started to learn that you could write your own codes and just see what happens. It was like anarchy. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you turn off. I would get like all these like crazy turtles just falling from the sky, different colors, and just like I was like, whoa, that was crazy game genie kind of ruined it it, it did if you hey, think about man. it speaking of video games uh justin you hit that that uh instagram post out out the park oh man. yeah it was, and that was so the audience that was a fun one the audience doesn't know well i don't know maybe they know now because we've probably commented on the page or whatever but uh justin uh organized that with rachel right so i had found this thing on uh like it was a viral tiktok and it was this um, dad that was that someone did and he was like you know it was a d- change your dad character and the dad was you know mowing the lawn a weed whacker a hammer and it was it was funny it was really funny it's it like when you're scrolling through characters on a video game yeah so and they, one pops up another one pops so up. i totally stole the idea i brought it to rachel i'm like this is hilarious we've got to get justin to do something similar but for for gym bros or gym guys or whatever so you know she she's she gets with justin they put together a series of all of these and they shoot it and then we're all talking about it, and you know, you know, it'd be really funny is if we make Sal a character in the game and we don't tell him. Yeah, <laughs> and so we're all in on it, but Sal wasn't. Yeah, so just yeah, naturally. And I shared. Yeah, I feels sh- so nice. I yeah. showed Rachel. I was like, listen, I've got this photo of Sal that I shared on my Instagram like two years ago. That oh, the sexy one. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that he posted, and then I took. It was a, a good feel, though. I'll be honest. I was like, ooh, I kind of. <laughs> I could kind of get into this this shorty short yeah, action. Yeah, the the wife beater with some booty shorts and and the chucks, dude. That's the and then the the broccoli was a nice touch. I didn't know it was coming, uh, yeah. so that was great. Oh, dude, yeah. it was awesome. Carrying my supplement bag. Yeah, you've kind of so so. Here's the thing that I, I don't know how I feel about this, Jessica. So Justin talks to Jessica and tells her he needs a pair of the shorts that I wore in that picture that you're talking about, Adam. Yeah, yeah. So these are they're short swim trunks. That's the style. In some places. Yeah. So, <laughs> in Europe. Yeah. yeah. 
It, 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 it yeah. keeps things free. Hey, okay? no, the, st- the, the style is there. So I know mean, we're razzing you. I mean, Viore just dropped their short shorts. Right. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. I was like, so, oh, Sal must be so hey, excited. Here's the deal, bro. You got nice legs and quads and hammies? Yeah. Put on yeah. them short ones and go to the beach. I mean, no, yeah. no. It, it does short, show them off. Short shorts are in. Uh, tucking your wife beater into your short shorts. I don't know how don't, much that is I in. Didn't tuck them in, did, <laughs> I? did I tuck in the wife beater too? <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. I, I, I was just trying to be as accurate as possible. So. <laughs> you got to see the waist. Yeah. That's why you got to see how the waist tapers in. I no, see. but so Jessica's like, hey, uh, uh, before you go to work, can you take this purse to to, to Justin? He's going to give it to Courtney because she, yeah. she wants this purse. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. Knowing you wouldn't look inside because it's a purse. And inside the purse was the shorts hey, that what I is, gave to Hey, Justin. what is that about men? That's like you just do like, it. You're just like, ugh. You just kind of grab it. <laughs> it is, right? Like, I don't want to oh, see what's yeah. in there. And you can't you can't just hold it over your shoulder. You got to just kind of like pinch it right. and like hold it away from you. <laughs> you know, like the further away from you is like the I, more manly hey, it is. We have to give Jessica credit. That was a brilliant move. Right lied, very smart. She lied so good and so smoothly. Now I'm questioning everything. Like, yeah, I did not. <laughs> Like she's really good at that. Uh, yeah, I know. Now I know I can trust her. So note to women, if you ever want to smuggle anything with men, just hide it in a purse. Yeah, put it in your big ass purse. <laughs> yeah, we'll, but, we'll never look in but there. But do you, do you ever go to the mall or you're at a, you know, whatever, and, and you see men outside of a like a, a store or outside the women's bathroom and they're holding their, their wives and girlfriends' purses? Oh, God. Yeah. Not, none of them are holding it properly. All of them grip the, <laughs> grip the purse. Yeah. With their hand and just kind of hang it like it's way out here. Just like, in case hey, I'm doing this as a you know I, I, for my wife. Yeah, I feel like nine. that's like the ultimate wife flex. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Here, hold, hold my purse. Hold my purse, honey. Hold, yeah. Yeah, you know hold this box of tampons. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ah. It, yeah. I'm not gonna hold it the right way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't want someone to think it's mine. Yeah. You know what I? You know what the 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 male flex is? Is do you guys do this? So you know Jessica always carries a purse, so she also has my keys and my wallet and stuff inside of it. So I don't put it in my pockets. Oh, I put yeah. it in her stuff. That's not much of a flex, though. Yeah. It's hidden in her purse. Not a big deal. Having a, 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 your wife making you hold your purse is like the, her yeah. purse is the ultimate. No, I do flex. the man spreading. I just you know when I sit anywhere, so just create space, <laughs> especially with the short shorts. Yeah, exactly. Show just everybody, let, let them out. Show everybody what, what time yeah, it is. Air it out. Yeah, you know that's I mean? disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so um, I, I I got some feedback now for the neuro effect from Paleo Valley. So they they sent two bottles of this new product called Neuro Effect, and I've been using it now for about 30 days. Legit. Yeah, you mentioned that, I think, the last time, right? Did I, did I talk about it already? I thought you mentioned so it. So it's, uh, it's legit. So it's designed, it's, it's a supplement, a natural supplement that is a nootropic. And so some of the ingredients include things like lion's mane, cordyceps, reishi, um, there's some uh, some organic whole uh, excuse me coffee arabica whole fruit extract which s- mm. spikes something called BDNF brain derived uh, neurotropic factor. So when you take it, especially if you combine it with caffeine, which is what I did, I do notice uh, a different uh, level of sharpness, especially after I've taken it for like a week or two. So Paleo, Paleo now, Valley's hitting it out of the park a little bit. Now, what is there anything different with this than like your typical nootropic that you've tried before? Is it? I don't like synthetic nootropics. Yeah. So there's yeah, there there there, there are the racetam supplements like paracetam and aniracetam and all that stuff. I don't like them. They can feel a little stimulatory. Uh, you build a tolerance, and it doesn't give you a nootropic effect by improving your brain health. It's almost like forcing. Yeah, you know? I usually end up getting a headache. That's, That's I get a yeah, headache from them too. Doug, you, Doug would get. Migraine. I think I gave it to you three times, and it made you. You said your teeth hurt, and then you got a headache, which is a weird. Your comment. Teeth hurt. That's what he said. <laughs> it's weird. He said it makes my teeth feel I can funny. Feel my hair growing, and then he got a headache. Yeah, <laughs> could have been the cocaine that I smuggled in. Yeah, there. <laughs> it must have been in the pill. And then here's the other thing: their organ complex. Um, I absolutely love it, and I'm having Jessica take it because it's high in the B vitamins oh, yeah. and some of the other nutrients that you get from organ meats. And because she's pregnant, you know, and organ meats, uh, I hate to say this, they're disgusting. Uh, I love supplementing uh, organ meats, yeah, they uh, just mainly for that reason. Yeah, just, it's hard. It's hard to. I mean, sometimes you can get creative and kind of work it into like burger patty and meat and stuff like that. But uh, for the most part, it's so much easier to supplement. Yeah, here's what I do: I get the chicken liver, so I'll get like like maybe two ounces of chicken liver. And then I'll cook it with a bunch of bacon and seasoning and butter. And then she'll get like 
big ass piece of bacon with the liver and just you know wow. real quick try to eat that don't even notice it yeah. don't even notice speaking it speaking of meat did you guys see uh, KFC is uh, pulling back their 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 slogan that they've had forever the finger licking good oh god <laughs> why why cuz of covid oh brother yes yeah cuz of covid it's not like their slogan said sneeze everywhere it's, <laughs> it's your own finger <laughs> i don't want to live in a world where i can't lick my own damn finger yeah yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's what's what happening well they changed remember when they changed their their brand and the first time? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What was Yeah, remind me. I remember. It was called, it wasn't KFC. It was called Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Fried Chicken. And was that to make uh, people that are overweight happier or something? The, uh, it was the whole, like, you know, bad press about f- fried foods. Yeah. So you don't want to put fried in the title. Here's what I think. Well, it still stands for that, though, right? It, it's it's literally what it is. Yeah, but yeah. now people. <laughs> Let's just call it something else. They'll fool them. You know what I think? I think. Companies need to just be proud of who they just, like. Just own, own it, it. Yeah. like yeah, Mister like Mister Salty Peanuts. You know what I mean? Those yeah. fuckers don't. They're, they're like right out with it. Salty, yeah. eat this. It's hella salty. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like what are you? What are you gonna? Yeah. Nobody goes to hey, nobody goes to KFC to not get fried yeah, chicken. Yeah, dude. You know what you're in for. If you're going to KFC for healthy food, you got more problems than the name of the food. <laughs> oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just it should just be Kentucky and then fried real big. Hey, did you, I was watching some weird thing? This is totally well. It's kind of on topic related to and they KFC was one of the uh one of the companies they were comparing like in other countries you know that um the size of the drinks and the serving size are actually all really different hmm. did you, you mean know that from like country to like, country like, yeah, like ours co- is enormous right like so they, they think KFC was like one of the examples and they showed like <clears throat> the popcorn chicken the chicken buckets like what their small medium and large consists of uh-huh. and then they did like this thing where they com- it was uh, on food wars so there's like mm. a YouTube channel I think it is that that does, it's called Food Wars, and they do all these different things. And this this episode I was watching was they took all these different fast food restaurants that are all over the world that are popular, like KFC, and they compared them like to the U.S. and like how they're and ours are like crazy different. Yeah, I mean, way way different. Like there's some countries where you know the the large soda for them looks like I think like what a standard large soda. And then over like the large soda at KFC is like a you know two liters or some shit of of soda. Yep. Same thing with the fried chicken, the popcorn chicken. It's all the culture, dude. Yeah. America is uh, a bigger bigger is better country and it starts with early culture because we had so much space. So if you go to like old European uh older European countries or countries that have been around for a long time You'll notice that their houses and the space that they like. You go to a refrigerator in some parts of England; they'll have refrigerators. They look like mini refrigerators, but that's what they use. Yeah. Same thing in Italy with house sizes and stuff like that. And, and so we started with more land. We have more space in our houses. Our cars yeah. are bigger. In You're, America, we eat out of buckets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. let that sink in. Yeah, bucket chicken. <laughs> yeah, here's your trough of uh, uh, m- uh, mashed potatoes, dude. Well, my family from and mashed potatoes isn't even a thing in the other country. Oh, really? Only in America, the mashed potatoes and gravy is a thing at KFC. Well, wow, that's that's like a staple How dare it, you? here. What the hell yeah. are they so doing? So if you go to like Sweden or somewhere, I can't remember where they were comparing, but you go somewhere else and you try yeah. and get, yeah. they don't even have mashed potatoes and gravy. They put vinegar and, and salt on their, you know, fries. Like, what, what's what, happening? Well, they have mashed codfish. No, they don't even have that. It's just not a part of the. It's just not part of KFC there. It, why even call it that then? Change the name. Well, well no, it's still KFC. There's still chicken. How are you gonna have fried chicken? There's without nothing mashed in mashed potatoes and gravy in uh, the KFC. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, man, doesn't make you know. It's like when my family uh, comes to visit from Italy, or when they first would start to come, they would remark about how big the cars were. They couldn't believe it, and they couldn't understand. Oh, yeah. They did not understand why Americans drove trucks. They they thought that was a strange. Why did why did they own a truck? Do they is it for work? I'm like, no, we just drive trucks. <laughs> like, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the utility of it, yeah, it makes plenty of sense to me. Everything here is, uh, yeah. is, is is just big, you know, including our food, which is not. I know. Hey, it's speaking all of big, have you have you guys seen our boy Juji Mufu man getting jacked? Oh, he's getting, dude. So I saw him last night on uh, American Ninja Warrior. What? I didn't did, even know he was on that show. Did he do did you well? Guys know that? Well, he went through like maybe the first two obstacles, and then he. Kind of got over the part where it was like on the rings, and then he fell into the water. 
But, I mean, he did a pretty good appearance. It was just funny because I was watching it with my kids and everything because they're really getting into parkour. And, like, you know, that was one of the big bummers of this whole thing is, like, they have they were just starting to really get into that gym where they're, like, being able to do all these, like, crazy gymnastic parkour moves and stuff. And so American Ninja Warrior became, like, a big thing. Like, they were getting excited about, like, you know, maybe sometime they could compete. And then I saw Gigi Mufu on there. I was like, hey, this big ass you know bodybuilder acrobat guy trying to do it have you thought about actually exploring um you know paying for like one of these guys that does that like if they're like to teach your kids well yeah that's what was the gym was that i took him i know well obviously the gym's not open anymore but have you thought about reaching out or finding somebody that trains for that i mean Uh, we've had dudes on the show that are in your neck of the woods no not yet like i i think i i would I would totally look into that. Uh, that's why I was trying to build things uh, in my backyard and all that. Uh, you know, we'll see if it's still there. Oh, so, man. You know, yeah. Oh, crap everybody you can, out. You Boy, can go well, right now and dodge planes. I was going to say, it would take a chance. Jump to the level. fiery hoop. Yeah. <laughs> you only get one chance. Yeah. Oh, my God. Exactly. <laughs> no, <just> oh, we <laughs> lost another one. Yeah, yeah. You're up next. You know, if you know if Justin hires someone to teach his kids par- parkour, you know for sure he's going to take the same class. Of course. Oh, I'm in, dude. Yeah, I've, I, I've told you guys. He like, secretly wants to do it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. he's 100. He's great. But yeah, yeah Mufu's getting uh, he's getting jacked. Yeah, he looks great. He's, he's a beast. Yeah, I, I must be him. all that natural stuff he's doing. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, saw, I saw him pull totally. the. I saw him pull like 700 on the on the uh, trap bar deadlift like it was nothing, man. That dude yeah. is strong, flexible, total. They, he's such an anomaly, bro. So yeah. Do you think he could go on stage and do well bodybuilding wise? Because he's uh, like getting uh, Am- uh, amateur, jacked. local yeah. amateur. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's that, that's so competitive, and and because he's trained to be like a strength athlete and flexible. I like like his physique. You know, That's oh, the kind oh, of physique I Don't like. get me wrong. He's got a great physique, but he doesn't have a, a, a pro. A little more athletic than yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he doesn't just, have like the big bubbly you know, arms and the, you know, his, what they look like. His chest for. isn't there. Like, no, he's got, yeah, he's got a lot of area. Like, he's I, got I, a, lo- I love talking shit about a dude that's I know. way more jacked. <laughs> I know, I know. That's it's why it's, I throw it, it out there. It is not talking like, shit. You asked, a, you asked a straight up question and I'm giving you a professional critique. Right. That's all it is. No doubt. How they judge all that. The dude is stronger and looks better than I do right now. So it's not a talk. It's shit like, it's like the, it's he, like, he looks great. To I me. would get crushed on a competitive stage right now. Okay, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's not me talking. It's shit. It's like those dudes online that critique like models, like this really yeah. pretty model. He's yeah. like her elbows too pointy. <laughs> yes, oh, I, <laughs> I don't yeah. like her eyebrows or whatever. And then you see Ben Pollock just pulling like an ungodly amount of weight these yeah. days as well. He's well, huge. You know, and the, he's another good example, right? Like he he did okay in bodybuilding, right? Like they, he they, looks like he'd do better now, though. Yeah, and, and same with Juju. He's he's been training like a bodybuilder, so. I mean, I definitely wouldn't count either one of those guys out if they really decided to take bodybuilding serious for two years. If they actually decided to train to be a a, a, a competitor, I mean, yeah. I guarantee they would look great. Here, now, here's the thing. This is for all those people out there that, and some people that we know you know, closely that we used to work with, who say that the deadlift is not the best uh, back the, exercise. Yeah, I know. Okay? So both those look guys. Look at the back. <laughs> look at those guys. Yeah, yeah. Look, at, look, at, look at Ben Pollock's back and look at Mufu's back. Now, both of them did other exercises like pull-ups and rows and that kind of stuff. But they did a lot of deadlifts, and that was primarily yeah, what they base did. Is deadlifts. Oh, and, you, and look at their backs. Look at the I, I the think, thickness. I think uh, Ben Polk did a, a post um, maybe about a month ago or so of like a throwback to when he competed, and it, you know he's got two guys on each side of him. And he is back just dwarfs the two dudes that he, are in the same same category, same level. And he same. wasn't doing lat pull downs. No. And all these, he was yeah. a power lifter. Yeah. And his back just dwarfed them. And it's all from deadlifts. That's why I think it's really funny when we see these. these. Tra- I mean, it's all for clickbait, right? And I always try to remind people that like tag me in those posts. We get sent that a lot, right? Because mm. we, we tout the how important that the deadlift is for for the mm. back so much that there's this this counter message that's out there right now from some and some smart trainers right there that that want to break down the movement of it and be technical about oh it's not really a back exercise it's a hip hinge movement that's the primary movers but that's just it sure it's that but the the isometric hole that the back is involved in and yep. when you can pull 
four, five, six, seven hundred pounds, like eight hundred pounds, like these two guys can do, you're gonna as a yeah, side effect, you're gonna, gonna get a massive back. Huge, hundred percent. Hey, so do you guys? You guys know about that at Attila's gym in New Jersey? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Ian, about that. Ian Smith and Frank Trimbetti. Want to give them? Is a, this the guy that's been fighting back and forth with being closed down? Yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. And I'm, you know, it's make it's infuriating to see the what the mayor there is doing to them. And I'm how just they, glad to see somebody fighting the, the system and, and everything. And here's why. This is this is some of the reasons why I love America. Okay, it's because of smart entrepreneurs. So he found a way. And by the way. Nobody is going to that gym who doesn't know the potential risks right. that they're going to have exposing themselves. They've done all the precautions. This is obviously they're trying to make an example of them. The mayor's, I don't know what the fine was, $10,000 a day or something stupid like that, you know, yeah. which is just what you just trying to flex your political muscle on a guy like that, which is just insane. And they kept to me. boarding up his door and everything. And then so they moved in to put, uh, oh, so they just moved in. Yeah, yeah. they just lived there. because yeah, they say they're going to put like a steel door on there now. Yeah. And what? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. anyways, just this fight it with the city. Up. And it's just so stupid. So, you know what he did? So, I, it makes me so happy. He was able to register his gym as a campaign office. Uh, and now they, because it's a campaign office, they can remain open. That's right. He's like Shut a, a Republican face. campaign uh, party. O- office, yeah, <laughs> just just to oppose the mayor. But yeah. here's the deal: if you want to go there and work out, you register as a member of the campaign, and now you can legally be there. So smart, isn't that wonderful? That's that so, is. <laughs> that's you so use great. their own tactics against them. Totally. I yeah. did not know that was going on. Oh yeah, I mean, just a brilliant, uh, brilliant move on his part. Um, and look, I feel so much. For businesses right now, for people yes. trying to do it legally, trying to do it the right way, who are not trying to lie to They're people. They're trying, trying to be to- smart. They're trying to be safe. You know, it's at some point, like we have to, I feel like there needs to be a, a bigger movement that that really like emphasizes small businesses and really like helps who's been hurt the most, uh, you know, as of late. Uh, I mean, these policies have crippled our, our, our small business well, economy. They, they're trying to take care of themselves. If they have no money, they can't take care of themselves. What do you want? What do you want them to do? Go go riot and so loot? So now we got to de- depend even further on the government to, to pay for. He's everything trying for to us? take care of himself, and yeah. the members coming in know the risks, and he's taking all the precautions. It just it's insane. Yeah. Well, to pile on this conversation, did you guys see the the guy who got busted for the PPP loan? So and no. the, for fraud, oh almost a million dollars, like eight hundred something thousand dollars. More to come. He's uh, well, going I, right to hell. That's my point. Right? Is that you know you have businesses like this trying to legitimately run a business, struggling. They're trying to shut them down close them you're talking about you know his livelihood to the to the state it's nothing it's pennies probably for them but for him it's his livelihood and we're and we're trying to condemn him and shut him down then you have other people that are taking advantage of the system you know this guy it was a contractor who had a business that defaulted like four years ago and applied then reapplied and ended up getting like 800 and something thousand dollars for that PPP loan and obviously didn't have even a business running whatsoever it makes you wonder how many people took advantage of that and how many people did that truly help wow. it's like cockroaches Crazy. where you see one there's probably you know a hundred of them and of course this is going to happen they pushed it through real fast yeah. what they're going to do now is go back at some point and audit this shit out of everybody which is why I recommended to people when they asked me about it I said unless you absolutely need it yeah. Don't get it because now you are shackled. Yep. You're going to be tied to all this, so just be very careful. That's what's going to happen. But I mean, I you know what? I'm afraid this is already starting to happen. We already are, are having a growing black market of of for work. People are starting to operate who've never broke the law before, who need to feed themselves, need to take care yeah. of themselves, are now oper- operating the black market because they have no kind of no other choice other do do that or go steal, yeah. which they don't want to steal. And we just drove uh, Uber and Lyft out of California. Actually, oh, no, they, they suspended, oh, they, they, suspended. They, they paused that. Oh, they oh, did. Oh, my God, sweet. So the courts paused that for a second to reevaluate and see what's going on. Oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, yeah, good, because yeah. I, I heard it moved through and I was angry. Wow. Oh, oh look, shit. there's another one. Doug just pulled up one. For, boy, that trump's mine, huh? Uh, wow. A Miami man oh. used fraudulent uh, PPP loan to buy a Lamborghini. Three point nine million dollars. Wow! Wow! Hit <laughs> the balls of these people. Gosh, I feel like I don't know, man. I feel like these people should be well, punished that's what to the when fullest you do the extent. Helicopter money, you know, when we fly out there and just throw all this money out to anybody and everybody that applies for. It. And you saw, I mean, yeah. you guys heard how the. I mean, I think Doug looked into it at one point. 
like the back, how much the backlog on the banks. I mean, it was so overwhelming. I'm sure banks were just approving stuff to get through everybody to get to people that actually need help. So along the way, I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands, of people took advantage. Well, of this. what I'm afraid, yeah. what I'm really afraid of is you have a huge percentage. The majority of people in this country are good people. Mm -hmm. They want to take care of their families. They want to follow the law. And they get pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And what I'm afraid of is at some point, it's like awakening a sleeping giant. And they're yeah. all going to be like, I can't. That's enough. I need to be able to take care of myself. I need to support myself. I can't survive anymore. That's it. I'm going to do it anyway. And then you're going to see negative repercussions from that. So I hope they consider all that stuff. Anyway, back to fitness because we're a fitness podcast. Uh, Men's Health published a, a study on resistance training versus cardio. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. interesting. You want to take a wild guess of which one uh, was better? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, I know, but do they know? Yeah, resistance training. Resistance training in terms of burning calories and all that stuff, body weight exercise is just as effective, of course, long term. Resistance training more effective because of the muscle building signal that you're sending from it. You know, one of the things that people don't realize with relying on cardio to burn all your calories is you're sending a signal to your body to get better at cardio. Part of that signal is let's learn how to burn yeah, less calories. Start burning less. And so you start to pare muscle down. When you do it with resistance training, you're still burning calories, but you're also sending the signal which says we need muscle, so less muscle loss occurs. Or if you do a really good job, you actually start to get some muscle building. So it's another study to kind of support you know that, and I, I'm happy because I think yeah. is this becoming more mainstream? You think is this uh, something that the general public is like? Well, maybe we don't need to just run on a treadmill all day to burn. Hopefully, fat. just in time for Sal's book. In my yeah, opinion, right? in my opinion, we're like five to ten years away from resistance training really going mainstream. I mean, like moms and dads and grandma and whatever when they want to go and be active, rather than putting on their jogging shoes or trying to get on a treadmill, they think. I'm going to get myself a pair of dumbbells and I'm going to do some strengthening exercises. I think that's we're all we're getting there and all these studies are starting to support it and that means that It'd doctors are supporting it. Great to see it. that, yeah. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is good. You know, Justin, I I wanted you to bring something up because you I think you mentioned it last week and I never got a chance to talk to you about it as you said something about Dion Sanders. Oh, What's yeah. going on with him? So, I just saw that he became uh, uh one of the main hosts for Barstool, I think uh, on their sports side. Oh, oh wow. So they actually which is a big deal because he actually came from you know, ESPN and major network television to now jump on to something that's like more social media uh, related. But Barstool is so big now. Uh, it just kind of shows you a big shift, uh, it, you know, in entertainment and, and the different platforms and the weight that they carry these days. Yes, yeah, so you're familiar with him, right? He's that famous badminton player. Yeah, yeah. he's a football player. <laughs> he's that <laughs> shuttlecock around. I yeah, remember. He Didn't he play for the he's Falcons? Fantastic at it. He did. He, he did. He did Falcons. actually. One of the teams yeah, he played yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He played for the Falcons. Also, yeah. 49ers. I think he played a little yeah, bit, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. Cowboys. The Cowboys. Yeah. He played for a little okay, bit. Okay. I just looked it up. Come on, man. Dude, Barstool is crushing. Braves. They are crushing. Of as a, as just as as a media company in general, those guys are that really owner guy. I don't know what his name is, but he cracks me up. Yeah, yeah. You ever watch? He's a funny guy. Have you ever guys watched his uh, his videos where he's talking about the trades that he does on the mar like yeah, stock market? Yeah, 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 talking shit. He talks shit to uh, what's his name, Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> he literally he calls him out. I've uh, outperformed you. Look at my picks. Look at my numbers. I love his personality. I yeah. think he's so very entertaining. It's absolutely hilarious. It's really. Oh, I want to ask you, Adam. Hmm. How's uh, Mozzie? I, I forgot uh, to bring that up. Oh so what, what's the deal? Uh, his eye. Remember, I told you they got in. A, the boys got into a fight. Um, you know, a while back, and it was so bad that uh, Bentley had scratched his eyeball. Mm. And like, remember, I told. I think I talked about this on the podcast. I don't remember if I did or not. But like, maybe almost a month ago, um, they got into a really bad fight. And like blood was like squirting everywhere and all over my walls, and it was just a mess. And Katrina's screaming downstairs, and I come down, and you know, Mozzie, Mozzie's eye is all bloody and stuff. And you know, they they get into they get into scuffles all the time. And you know, Bentley just caught him with his his fingernail and it caught him right on the eyeball, and just fucked it all up. And it's just it's something I we can't fix, like surgery. And because the Bulldogs have a hard time breathing and their mind are getting older 
they're at risk to put under for surgery. So mm -hmm. it needs to be like a life threatening thing for you to even risk putting them under. To Is do it because they when they go under anesthesia they have they, they might stop breathing? Yes, because uh, they already have trouble trouble breathing as it is. You put them you put them under, and then there's a good chance that they might not come out after that. So is it infected now, or is it something you're? So it's managing? so it it was getting better, and we had you know a poor guy has to wear that little donut thing that all the time that I know he absolutely hates, and I had got it down, and then uh, he also has allergies. So like when the allergy season kicks up, or if there's something going on that that is high for allergies at the, for him. All of a sudden, he'll be itching a lot, and so his face was irritated, itching, and he was rubbing it. I came out one day, and like his eyeball was like inside out, like it was just Whoa. completely all this this scar tissue had built up, and it was inflamed. And yeah, my poor dude, dude, I felt so bad. So what, for what are they? What are you doing? Just antibiotics? Yeah, uh, yeah, antibiotics. Uh, give him some pain uh, killers, and then he has like this, uh, you know, what's it called? Um, like very similar to what you use for contacts, um, like like, a, like eye drops or yeah, or something. Yeah, but there's I forget what the what the what it is. Stringent? Huh? No, 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 not Visine. It's I'm talking about the, the the type of fluid that it is, but ointment. Yeah, it's, it's there's a type though. It's okay. not ointment. <laughs> it's uh, but you, I've got to put that in his eye every day right now to keep it down. Does he let you touch his eye? Yeah, he does. Because I think it hurt. I think it bothers him so bad that like I'll put like a hot compress on it to calm him down. You could tell it feels good for him. Because he can't, he can't do anything himself. So all I got to do is put it on him, and he sits right there. So you can tell that probably oh, relieves him. How old are they? Uh, seven and nine now. What is the life expectancy of yeah, a bulldog? That's about where they're at. So you're kidding me. Yeah, yeah. Most bulldogs don't live past ten years old. So oh. if you get a bulldog to go ten years, but so my, my hope is because I feed my bulldogs different than like our, our breeders thought I was like starving them all the time. They just let, cause they'll eat, they'll just eat and eat and eat and eat and they sleep and sleep and sleep and they don't require much exercise. Like exercise for the bulldog is like one walk around the block. That's it. Like they do that once or twice a day and that's complete exercise mm -hmm. for them. They're not, they don't, that was part of the appeal to them for me. Cause I bought Bentley when I was still in my condo and I was like, okay, I don't want like a dog, like Justin's dog that needs to be ran and exercised on a daily basis or they destroy things. I need yeah. a dog that wants to be lazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that want to sleep and just kind of lay around and the bulldogs are like the best for that. But yeah, so they don't, they're not supposed to live very long, but I also keep their diet in check. You know, they, they eat a half raw, half uh, dog food type of diet. I, uh, I manage based off of their movement. So you know, I feed them more when we are going out and they're active and I feed them less when they're not. And, you know, I think uh, some people that see that, I remember my, like my breeder used to think I was being cruel to the dog and I'm like, I'm they're not, I'm not being cruel to the dogs. I, I watch their weight and they easily can go up. And I've noticed when anytime they get about 10 or 15 pounds heavier than what they are, which they can easily put that weight on. If I let somebody watch them for like a week when we travel and they just feed them treats and feed them stuff like that. Yeah. I'll come back and they won't even fit in their their harness and their lead. I'm like, <laughs> fuck, man. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I get that all the time too. Like if if uh, Arlo has like any of his ribs showing at all, even though he's like lean and like muscular and like people will be like, oh, I don't know if you're feeding him enough. You know, I'm just like, oh, you just want him to be like a, a fat waddling turd. No, it's our, walking around. It's like our country. It's, yeah. our, it's where we we think that we do the same thing to our animals. It's it's it, whole. It's and, true. There's a there is no no. This is no exaggeration. There's a dog obesity epidemic too there is i know we yeah. overfeed them we feed them table food like and i just don't do that stuff so my hope is yeah. that because i've taken good care of them like that because i i when they put on that extra pounds what i was uh, alluding to in that story is that right away i can hear wheezing and they have a hard time breathing they snore way louder when i do when they when they're overweight like that when i keep their weight in check you know they breathe normal they don't have anything going on with their mm -hmm. wheezing their snoring is is you know still there but it's cut to a minimum in comparison so I don't know. I hope I get. Uh, I hope I get more than ten years out of them, but they're definitely uh, getting up there in age. Yeah, yeah. Jessica told me she found a dog. She said I look like. Maybe Doug can pull it up. <laughs> look up sh giant Schnauzer. Schnau. I was gonna say Schnauzer. No, you weren't. I was. See, dude, I don't, I don't look know like why. A Schnau but, she's yeah. like, you look, this dog looks like you. This let is me, the kind of dog you should get because it kind of looks like you. Oh, let me see. Let me. Yeah, see. look at the picture and tell me what you think. Is that what's know. in Lady and the Tramp? I feel uh, like you look like the Lady and the Tramp dog. Damn, I guess uh, I do look like Scottish. That. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, or it's got, oh you know. yeah, that's the lady in the tramp. Yeah, you yeah, totally look schnauzer. like that. Yeah. Why do I look like a? How do I look like a schnauzer? I think you even look like the lady in the tramp dog even more because I mean, he's, he's got a little bit of longer. he's got a little bit of gray in him. Pull up yeah. lady in the tramp. But. I don't really. Yeah, yeah. I look like a schnauzer, huh? Yeah, yeah. it is. Oh, so it, I look. So these dogs are apparently. Yeah, pretty, dude, that's totally you right there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he's handsome. Yeah. yeah.
First question is from Chamu, WBFF Pro. What is the best way to keep muscle while cutting? Is it possible to still build the body part while in a deficit? All right. So let's start with the first part. Is it, uh, what is the best way to keep muscle while cutting? First of all, if you're anybody who's trying to lose weight, anybody who's trying to burn body fat, one of your primary goals should be to maintain muscle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because every time you lose muscle, you reduce your metabolic output, meaning you slow down your metabolism. That means it's more difficult now to maintain a lean body weight. And the likelihood that you'll gain the weight back later on increases uh, in response to how much muscle you lose. So this should definitely be a number one goal. Now, there's two main ways that you prevent this from happening. The first one, lift weights, obviously. Lifting weights sends the right signal to the body. It says... We need this muscle. Even though calories are low, we still need to be strong. Now, to be more specific, I, in my experience, one of the best ways to keep muscle while dieting is to train for strength. It actually works better to train for strength while you're dieting because strength is such a loud muscle building yeah. signal. The second thing is have high protein. High protein, low calorie diets by themselves, even if people don't lift weights, uh, they turn out with less muscle loss. So regardless of how you're working out, if your protein is high with your calories are low, that alone will help you keep muscle. Yeah, up. which is definitely like, again, this is counter to a lot of people's thought process when they're trying to lose weight because they're trying to really, you know, put all their attention in that direction. So they'll add on the hit training style, they'll add on the circuits and, you know, extra cardio and cut uh, their calories kind of all at once, which you know, again, we're inevitably we're going to do this long enough. We're going to start, you know, losing muscle as a result, uh, you know, as well as uh, the rest of your body mass. So to, to focus your attention more on strength while you're cutting is such a more effective strategy. Oh, I'll add a little bit more to that. I think I don't think it's as simple as just uh, strength training as far as your training. So if you just came out of a strength cycle and you're going into a cut, I think changing into anything that's novel to the body is ideal. So if I was training a, a five by five routine or I was lifting for strength right before I went into a cut, which is was normally very common for me. A lot of times I was in a strength cycle when I was adding calories. When I switch out of that, uh, I want to train what's most novel. So if I'm used to training a five by five or a strength routine, going to a more hypertrophy type of uh, routine actually kept more muscle on my body than staying in the in the the five by five type of training. So it really matters what you were doing before you head into the cut. Mm. So I, I always like to change my client and my own programming when I transition from you know either bulking or maintaining whatever you want to call it to a cut for a show. So whatever your programming looks like heading into the cut, I want to do something a, a lot different. You know, so that's the first thing. The other thing is. I also want to minimize how much cardio I'm doing in order to cut. I like to do it all through calorie and manipulating my training program before I start to add any of the cardio in there. A big mistake that the competitors that I would train would would make or assume is, okay, It's I'm eight weeks or 12 weeks out from a show. It's time to start cutting. They introduce cardio right away. I think that's a mistake uh, when you're trying to hang on to muscle. Car, the, as much muscle as you have on your body going into a cut, it, it is not advantageous to keep all that if you're also running on a treadmill or doing the Stairmaster. The body will see that and go or feel that and go, oh, let's get rid of some of this expensive tissue because he or she is making me sit on this, this Stairmaster for 30 minutes or an hour every single day or in some cases two hours a day. So minimizing the amount of cardio you're doing during a cut and using your calorie intake or your manipulation of your training to create the caloric deficit is a far better strategy than just adding uh, than cardio. And then I think the obvious one, especially when you're talking to someone who's a WBFF pro, uh, I'm sure she knows that you know keeping up the protein is 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 a must, right? So that's a must. I think that's an obvious one. The common offenders that I see with the competitors is they are following a routine that is similar to the one they were following before the cut. 
Uh, and that's not going to send a very loud signal for the body to adapt and change and build muscle. So you want to change the programming. And then the other big common offender or mistake I see is the adding cardio right away. I'm I'm saving cardio for that that peak week or maybe the week or two before. I'm not introducing it until then. And that was something that uh, I think was really hard for a lot of uh, people that hired me to when I was coaching them to grasp when I would tell them like, no, we're not doing any cardio. Not yet. Not yet. And I'd save it till the final weeks uh, so I could preserve as much muscle as possible. Yeah. Now, as far as possible, is it possible to build muscle while in a deficit? Yes. Is it likely? No. It's highly unlikely. On steroids. It's, it's Yeah. If you're natural- That's when you see it. You can do it, but you, boy, you need to be in a very small deficit, meaning you're not trying to burn a lot of body fat. You need to have the right amount of training, high protein, good, loud muscle building signal- and then maybe what will happen is your body will take some of the calories and, and energy it needs from body fat, um, and you'll have enough that you're intaking uh, to fuel muscle growth. But it's very unlikely. It's, it's very hard to build while in a reduced calorie diet. Now, if you're, if you're a beginner, I've done this all the time with clients. When it's a brand new, you're not lifting weights, you're coming to me and you're totally sedentary. I've gotten people to burn body fat and build muscle all the time. As you become more advanced, it becomes far more difficult to, to make that happen. Next question is from Point Blank Strength. Do smelling salts actually do anything physically to help you lift? I heard one power lifter say it opens up your sinuses for easier breathing, but is that accurate? Ooh, do you, did you guys ever use smelling salts at all in your yeah, training? Yeah, yeah. and I, I picked this question because I actually had one of my best PRs of all time, uh, bench pressing. I did uh, smelling salts right before that. And I don't know, it, it really, to me, it was more of a alertness like I've never had before. Like I was very, just like very clear. Everything was like around me. I was just very focused on just one thing. And so I could kind of, uh, I could kind of see the benefit to that to where I'm just literally I'm so present that everything was actually working in unison at once I don't know you know the science behind all that but I know it definitely I felt the effects of it yeah I discovered smelling salt so I knew that power lifters sniffed something and yeah. then would do a lift didn't know what it was I knew boxers they used to use in boxing with the, you know the boxer goes in between rounds and then I saw that in Rocky right in Rocky uh, you know Mickey gives him the smelling salts to wake him up or whatever right but I'd never ex I'd never tried them or anything right so fast forward I'm managing a 24-hour fitness I'm probably 21 years old so I'm young and we had the first aid kit uh, at the front desk every gym has one and in the first aid kit there are Smelling salts. Oh, really? Yeah, all I of them have it, right? I didn't so know that. If someone passes out, you could, you know, help wake them up. I didn't up know or, that those were in there. Yeah, and so the way they work, the way that those ones work, is they're like these little packets, and there's like a little. It's, you break it open. It's right? like a glass ampule inside, yeah. and you just crush it, yeah. and then all right. So and yeah, then you smell ammonia it. Ammonia or whatever. Comes yeah, out. yeah, yeah, and you smell it. And so um, let's see, Doug pulling up a picture of them. No. So anyway, so I uh, I had these at the front desk. I saw that they were smelling salts. Didn't know what they were uh, or how they worked. And I thought, huh, there's like 15 in here. I'm just going <laughs> to take one out. Couple, yeah. I'm just going to take one out and see what it does, right? Right. And I had no idea. So I cracked it and I made the mistake of just going for a big, oh, oh, big huff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it mistake. knocked me on my ass. Could do. <laughs> I went back and went, oh. So then what I did is there's that CVS or whatever that's like two stores down from the, the 24 Fitness. Mm -hmm. I went in there and I bought. A bunch of smelling salts. So I'm like, this is going to be the best thing of all time. I didn't time. even know CVS carried that. <laughs> yeah, you can get in there. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. So I, I got what I would do <laughs> with my sales guys is when they were when they were on the phone making phone calls or whatever. When I noticed that they weren't making calls or they were lethargic, yeah, yeah. I would have one in my hand. I'd crack <laughs> it and I'd put it right in front of their face. I don't wake yeah. them up and then they go, ah, oh, stop it. And we had this blast with smelling salts. So that was my experience with them. Then I never used them to lift. Until uh, later on, when I really, really got into heavy deadlifting and wanted mm -hmm. to see what I can go to. So I bought the same ones. And before I would do a heavy, heavy lift, I would sniff it and then I'd go and I'd lift the weight. And yes, anecdotally, it definitely worked. It definitely gave me a, a new sense of alertness. I felt like I can rip with more strength and all that stuff. And so anecdotally, they definitely work. Boxing now banned smelling salts. I don't know if you guys know this. Oh, I didn't know that. Because the belief was if someone has a concussion, 
then we don't want to like artificially wake them up and go get beat down more. Mm -hmm. So they banned smelling salts because they thought it would it would it would motivate fighters to keep going out mm. uh, even when they were hurt. Yeah, get more head trauma. Now, the science behind them is interesting. It does irritate the, the membranes in your nose and in your lungs, causing you to inhale and increase oxygen uh, intake. So it does give you that kind of – and it does stimulate a central nervous system response, so you do feel like you're kind of more awake. It also – the smelling salts also in, increase nitric oxide, believe it or not. Mm. Oh, really? There's this paradoxical, paradoxical effect with smelling salts where – Stimulates the central nervous system, but blood pressure drops because your blood vessels open up. Uh -huh. So for those reasons, yeah, it, it probably does help with your heavy lifts. But here's the thing: you don't want to overdo it. Unless you're, oh, a, yeah, if you're a competitive, li you know, lifter, uh, it's fun. Go for it. If you're not, waste your time, waste your money, and don't play. Don't. It's not something to be played with. Yeah. If you've never taken a sniff of smelling salts. You are going to be in for a rude awakening. It can't you... be good long term. I've known some power lifters that like use it all the time, like almost in every workout session. And I'm like, dude, this cannot be good, uh, <laughs> you know, for for your health. Like uh, later on, I'm I'm sure like there's no studies out there. Well, yet. There's got to be some brain cells getting killed. Yeah, like, like a lot of brain up cells like that. <laughs> hey, Doug, did I ever have you smelling salts when I trained you? Never, never did. Okay, so yeah. I'm glad I didn't do that to any of my clients. <laughs> yeah, let me check yeah. real quick. It yeah. definitely works. I mean, there's something to didn't it. Didn't I have you guys? use it once when we I, I mean we, I've yeah. used it plenty of times I just thought it was I thought it was like waking the CNS up that's what I figured yeah. I figured it just amplifies just, it. Ah, yeah, it, it's very temporary but it really like kicks in right almost like uh, what is it a post activation potentiation or yeah. whatever it's or called like getting slapped in the face yeah yeah, yeah or getting slapped yeah. really quick kind of yeah, wakes you up they do that too yeah, right I, I feel like fact. it's it's more like that I didn't know that the, I actually didn't know that it increases nitric oxide yeah a little that's bit that's interesting but to it's me. not enough to make a difference so before everybody go buy a bunch of smelling salts for the new lift or whatever it's it's not going to make a difference no. for you but if you if you're a strength athlete and you compete yeah. user beware you need to practice using them yeah are they are they allowed to use it in a lift in a meet powerlifting yeah yeah oh uh, yeah yes yeah. so, I, so I, I see value in it for that person you yeah, know yeah. if you're yeah, if you're, you're competing yeah if you're competing and it gets you that extra five or ten pounds out but i mean for the average lifter who's just trying to get stronger and, and i don't think it's beneficial muscle. for bodybuilders or people trying to connect if anything it'll probably prevent you from connecting to a muscle because your instinct when you smell it is just lift. Yeah, you're not like oh, it's I'm almost fight or flight. Just bah! yeah, it's yeah. not like you smell it. And you're like I'm going to connect to my glutes more. It's like you yeah. smell it and you just, ah, you know, you go after Always it. Trying to connect to those but glutes. you do build up a tolerance. This is how this is to back up what you're saying, Justin. It's probably not good for you. I mean, they'll start with the little ampules of smelling salts. Next thing you know, they go to you know nose torque, and then the strongest <laughs> versions of I love like that nose torque. What a great name. Yeah, dude, and it's literally so strong that you open the bottle and you hold it like. Yeah, a foot or two from your face, and then do one of these with your hand. You're kind of you wafting. wafted it. Yeah, yeah. You can't like. Yeah. Oh my god! Have you smelled it right up your nose? Oh, yeah. You start bleeding unless yourself. you have a high tolerance. What is it? What is it? Ammonia or yeah, what? Is that ammonia what? salts? Yeah. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Next question is from Keegan R. How often should I be doing mobility work for each body part? I have multiple areas hindering my lifts, but find it hard to spend the time needed each day. Yeah, the best way to approach, first of all, let's think of the goal with mobility training. The number one goal with mobility training is to improve your coordination and connection to ranges of motion. Yeah. Okay. The goal is not to build muscle, the goal is not necessarily to get uh, crazy strength gains. Now, more mobility leads to building more muscle and more strength gains, but the goal of mobility training is not the same as when you're lifting weights. The goal is to connect. And the best results you get from connecting is frequent practice, frequent short practice. So in other words, 30-minute mobility session is not going to be as effective as five, 10-minute, you know, uh, or five, five-minute mobility sessions, I should say, or something yeah. like that, or five, six-minute. And you know. it's such an individual uh, dependence on, so if it's impeding on like specific lifts, like your technique, uh, I can't like hold my shoulders in that position for very long. My knees are always buckling out. Things like that, it, it really, you know, it. I would say that it is a priority. It's something now that you do need to consider long term. If you don't address it, the more load and stress you apply to your joints that are, you know, not in a, in a favorable position uh, where they're supposed to be, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're going to suffer the consequences of that. So it's really up to, uh, you know, assessing which ones are the, the the biggest offenders. And I would focus my attention more on the the three or four exercises that will really help 
help to you know address those specific issues you have in in terms of not being able to hold yourself in a specific posture to 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 promote those types of movements. We I feel like we get this question a lot. I get this a lot in my DMs too. I don't know if you guys get this a lot. I do uh, a ton, maybe because I talk about mobility a lot on my Instagram, mm -hmm. and people are always looking for like a prescription for me, like tell me how many times I need to do this or how many times I should do that. And it, it's, this is a really hard one. And I think Justin, you, you hit it uh, on the head really well, which is you look at what the, 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 the greatest offenders are first. Like what is, what is hindering, you know, whether it be your squat or your deadlift or your overhead press, whatever movement that you're trying to get better at, what is the greatest offender? Is it your ankle mobility? Is it your hip mobility? Is it your ability to retract your shoulders? Is it your forward head? I mean, all those things are probably issues for most people. It's very common. It's very common for people to lack ankle mobility. It's very common for people to lack hip mobility, shoulder mobility, to have this excessive forward head. Those are all very, very common. So it's like, okay, where do I start? Well, you know, I personally, I started with my ankle and my hips. Like that was, I was trying to improve my squat. The, the grossest offenders on there, even though I had, you know, forward shoulder and a slight forward head, and that is an offender too. The, gr the greatest offender was my ankle and hips. My ankle and hips was not allowing me to get depth in my squat. And so that I just kind of hammered those like crazy. That was the one. And, and for me, it's all about, it's trying to create th this as a habit in my daily routine. It's not like, oh, programming it where, and we did this in Prime and Prime Pro for people to to make it easier for them so that we teach them how to uh, program it uh, in those programs. But really, it's just, it's about repetition. It's trying yeah. to do it as much as you possibly can. As you, frequently as possible. Yeah, my recommendation is to go through something like Prime Pro and you pick out one or two joints that you really want to improve the mobility or that's the greatest offenders. And you and all day long, you just you know get down in that combat stretch all day long. Get down in those ninety nineties. I mean, you're trying to do it like Sal was saying. You know, five five minute times is far far better than you doing this one long session of it. You're trying to get as frequent as possible, and and, and then you address the next joint. Yeah, and the, the best way to, the best way to do this is to inject it into your regular day. So let's say mm -hmm. at night you watch TV uh, with your spouse or whatever. Okay, while you're watching TV get into mobility positions or every morning and every night you brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay. While brushing my teeth, I do this mobility move with my ankle or, uh, after dinner or when I'm washing dishes, if you inject it throughout the day with your normal routine, you'll be, you'll do a very good job of being frequent and you'll see really rapid results. If you try to structure it and schedule it like a workout, it's not going to work as well. Next question is from Leonza Peroni. I've been tracking and working with an online trainer for a while, but the constant tracking, measuring, and weighing has started to become an issue for my mental health. What are your suggested steps for someone who wants to continue to stay healthy, but also wants to transition into a more intuitive, less calculated lifestyle? Mm, okay, so Adam always talks about something called what's your intended uh, result or what's the intended- Desired outcome. Desired outcome, right? What is it that ultimately you'd like to achieve with, uh, with your nutrition? And ultimately, I think I can confidently say that for most people or for everybody, the goal is to have a comfortable, stress-free, healthy relationship to food where with food where- you eat healthy and you eat in a balanced way where you can enjoy the occasional dinner out and pizza or drinks, but for the most part, you eat in a way that's very healthy and you don't sit there and stress about it all the time. It's just a natural part of how you live. That's the goal, okay? That's where we all want to end up. Now, what you're stuck at is you are stuck at right before that, okay? So I'm going to go through... I've talked about this before, but there's really four stages of, of awareness or learning around anything that you're trying to accomplish. And the, the, I'll go through them real quick, but the first stage is unconscious uh, incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. This is where most this is most people, by the way. Most people mm -hmm. are here. They they don't even know what they don't know about nutrition. They they've heard a few things on the TV or on the internet, but they really don't know what they don't know. Then they pick up their first book or they listen to a mind pump episode, and then they start to realize what they don't know. Like, wow, I really don't know a lot of stuff. That's the next stage, which is conscious incompetence. You're consciously incompetent, okay? The third stage is where you're stuck. The third stage is conscious competence. You have to like 
consciously think about what to do in order to eat healthy, okay? That's a great stage to get to, terrible place to stay at. So let's use something else. Let's forget diet for a second, okay? Uh, if you're listening to this podcast right now, you are breathing in a way that is unconsciously competent, okay? You naturally breathe. You don't have to think about every single breath, although maybe you are now because I mentioned it. Imagine if every time you walked or every time you breathed, you had to consciously think about every step I took or every breath that I take. It would feel very much like you feel right now with your diet where you have to weigh and track and measure everything. Great place to transition from, terrible place to be stuck in. This can become a stress in and of itself. It can also create a bad relationship with food itself. So how do we move out of it? Very slowly. Here's what I recommend. Give yourself right now one day a week and call it your intuitive day. And your goal in that day is to ask yourself, how do I feel? What foods are going to best serve me? Am I really hungry? Am I bored? What feelings am I having around food? While I'm eating, I'm sitting down. I'm not distracted. I'm being very aware of the food. How does it taste? How do I feel afterwards? How do I feel before? And don't judge any decisions you make on that intuitive day. 100%, I guarantee it's going to resemble more of a cheat day at first. But as you continue to get used to this intuitive day, it'll become a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more healthy. Once you've mastered one intuitive day, don't track, right? Don't judge it. Once you feel comfortable with it and it starts to feel healthy, then you add another day and so on. And then eventually you have seven days a week intuitive. This doesn't mean you'll ever, you'll never go back to tracking. It just means now you're starting to figure out how to do this without having to track all the time. Now, that was a very sensitive approach, and I think the, uh, probably a good, and, and we'll stick with that being the best answer. But I can't help but want to challenge a little bit of this because I want to know what a while means, and I also want to know what what is it doing to your mental health. Um, sometimes uh, people get frustrated. Clients would get frustrated when I'd ask them to track um, and I know we talk about uh, that, you know, tracking also and weighing your food all the time can also be an eating disorder, right? But when I see that, I, I don't see the person who's trying to learn how to eat properly or learn what macros are. That's normally the competitor who is like, been tracking and weighing for five years consistently, and they don't know how to operate without doing that. They've 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 attached themselves to that so much that they don't know how to move away from that. I don't see that as often in a client who just hired me, and I'm trying to get them to learn what they're consume, consuming on a regular basis. So when I hear something like, "I've been training with a an online trainer for a while," well, what's a while? Two months? Five months? Are we talking about three years he's had you tracking like that? If you've only been tracking for a month or two and you think it's affecting your mental health and you're ready to give up on it and you want to go to intuitive eating, you may not be ready for that yet. Mm. So I, I would caution you of you know to thinking that it's it's creating some sort of you know mental issue with you because you're having to track right now and maybe you just need to continue on with tracking for a little bit until you learn. Until here's what I would do with a client: if I can't put a plate of food down. And you get give me some idea of how much protein, carbs, fat, and calories that plate is, and you're completely clueless to it, you still got some tracking to do in my eyes. You do, mm. but I'll say this. If you're already identifying that it's causing you undue stress and, and issues, you said mental health, and you're identifying, I don't like this relationship and de developing with food, yes, you probably, and if it's only been a short time, at some point you need to revisit it and see if you can get through it without it feeling unhealthy. But you, it's okay to take a break. Because here's the thing, if you push through and you already have, and you're even if it's only a week, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm having this, uh, this real unhealthy relationship with food that's developing, and you're identifying that, it's okay to take a break, gather yourself, and then revisit it. Here's a couple tips. One, stop weighing yourself and stop focusing on aesthetic goals. Start there, because sometimes they go hand in hand. Typically, it's somebody who's constantly weighing themselves, constantly looking in the mirror, testing their body fat, goes hand in hand with this stress over weighing and measuring food. Instead, mm -hmm. maybe focus on performance a little bit. How strong am I in the gym? How good do I feel? How's my mobility? That might help. You might need to take a break for a couple weeks, go back to it with that attitude, but Adam's 100% right. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get to intuitive eating is if you have knowledge yeah. about and awareness around food. And some of the most basic knowledge around food includes 
calories, proteins, yeah, fats. Yeah, this I can't help but think of like the the kid who's wanting to to skip doing all the long form and to learn how to do division, and they just want right. to get right to the calculator. You're yeah. like, give me the calculator. This is well, I this is like stressing too, me out too much to have to yeah. figure this out. Yeah. I feel like too maybe this trainer kind of jumped them right into tracking right. versus like focusing on you know something that wasn't too foreign for them in terms of their lifestyle currently so that may be a bit of a resistance that they're feeling now to where this is like so different than what I would normally do to mm -hmm. where I could I could just introduce whole foods I could just introduce you know like slowly uh, a ways to incorporate healthier habits versus all of a sudden now I have to be so dialed so measured uh, with the way that I'm approaching that's this. a great no, point that's an excellent point and so I, I hammered this person first now I'm going to come back and defend you with the point that Justin's making that I would never start any client out with you know if you're in your first month or two I mean we've talked about this on the show um, you're I'm not making you weigh and measure and track and do all those things I, we're we all we're doing and we've talked about this on the show many a times is I'm looking to introduce foods to you and I keep it simple I'm going to be the one who like looks I might have you track for one week so I can get an idea mm -hmm. of what you're doing and then from that I have a snapshot of your habits and behaviors and the foods that you're probably lacking mm -hmm. and then I'm going to tell you I want you to add something so I might say eat just like you're eating but now what I want you to do is mm -hmm. add you know a bowl of Brussels sprouts every single day or this and give you three or four different options to keep it very simple. That's all. And then I'm going to add something else down, you know, three, four weeks down the road. So, you know, it, this could also be the the lack of experience coming from the trainer, knowing how to work with you. So part of our job is to be able to work with all different types of people. And if you're somebody who has a really hard time tracking, you may not be ready for that yet. And so I would have a different approach in your defense. Yeah, now here's some, without knowing you, so I'm going to I'm gonna guess here, but I think what might be a good approach for you if you want to try something different to start with, if, if this kind of tracking isn't working for you, try doing this. Try just hitting protein targets and avoiding he heavily processed foods. That's it. Don't mm. worry about calories, carbs, fats, anything else. Just worry about, uh, I'm going to hit my protein target, and I'm going to really try to avoid eating uh, heavily processed foods. Start there. Usually what happens when people do that is their body self-regulates and they start to eat uh, right amounts of calories. Heavily processed foods really encourage us to overeat. And nine out of 10 times when I have clients kind of cut those out, their calories tend to fall right where they need to be. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram, even Doug. Look for Doug at Mind Pump Doug. Find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Find me at Mind Pump Sal. And find Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Trying to feel this one out is like trying to feel how many calories you're eating every single oh, day. Yeah. It's never you, gonna be accurate. You're gonna be off. I'm talking about learning to increase your workload slowly over time. This is a very effective way of, let's say you're you're not necessarily focusing heavy on strength. Uh, the pump is, you know, there, but it's not.